thank you all for coming. Um, with the, the, the only session in this, at this entire conference that has an emoji in the title, I think. So um, we thought we'd do a panel on how OSM loves, interacts with government and vice versa. Um, and uh, we've got some, we've got a, we rounded up some really good uh, panelists here and I'll let them introduce themselves. I'll start off with a little story though. Um, Back when I got involved with OSM, it was only a couple of years old. And um, the reason, does anyone know one of the, re at least one of the reasons why OSM came to be? What do you, what? Survey. Right, yes. So there were some people really fed up with uh, the lack of uh, open data coming from, um, uh, uh, from government sources, really. Um, the ordnance surveying in the UK uh, charged a lot of money for their data. And, and they, they no longer do, but they did back then. And um, so a couple of folks, Steve Coast and some friends, they started uh, a project that we now all get, get, get together and talk about uh, to get around these restrictions of not govern, government data not being available um, in Europe back then because that's where it started. And then, um, so move forward seven or eight years, I moved to the United States. I was in the Netherlands back then, I'm Dutch. Um, and then I found that in the US, basically mainly the open is the default when it comes to government data. So I was like, oh, I'm really excited about this. So I started making friends at the state, at the state JS department in Utah where I live and um, started s seeing how we can interact with, uh, with, um, with government data, but then, um, it's still, I found it's still, it's still, there's still a lot to, um, to talk about, even now, again, seven years later. Um, a lot of things that are unsolved problems still, um, like how, how do we transfer data back and forth? Um, how can we benefit from each other's work? And um, uh, what, what kind of role the license plays in all this? Um, so we- <laughs> <laughs> You're starting there, wow. <laughs> I don't know. Um, we'll get there, I'm sure. So um, that's that's why we thought we we do a panel and um, and I'll, I'll let all the panelists introduce themselves. So my name is Martijn. I've been involved with OSM for quite a while. Um, I I don't have any particular um, any particular uh, uh, license or or uh, um, authority to speak on this on this. So that's why I have these 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 smart people um, to talk about this. But I'll have some questions. I hope you have some questions as well. Um, feel free to uh, to raise your hand at any point and um, and and bring up your own topic uh, as, the, as, the, as the session goes on. Um, but for now, I'll just kick it off by um, going from, from, left, uh, from my left, your right, to left, to have people introduce themselves. Enjoy. Thanks, Martin. Uh, my name is Margaret Spiker. Um, I'm a map scientist and a tech coordinator in Denver, Colorado. I work for a company called Zenity Corporation, so I'm largely a government contractor. And um, my client, my primary client is the state of Colorado Secretary of State Office, where we run a user engagement competition called Go Code Colorado. Uh, we ask people, challenge technologists to solve business problems using public data. And so the other half of that contract is working with all the state agencies, local, regional, to get them uh, to evangelize the value of them putting their data out into the public and then giving them resources on the technological side to help them do that. So uh, we've kind of, you may have noticed I coined two titles or two terms in my title. I'm gonna coin a third one called data liaison where um, we speak human and we speak tech and we help people get to the end goal of making their data available. So um, I don't work for a government agency directly but um, I am uh, in great support of open data for Colorado and obviously for OSM. Oh, thanks, uh, my name's Jonathan Leak. I'm the data architect for the St. Louis Regional Data Alliance. Uh, we're kind of a new organization, about a year old, been in the position for about three months. Um, but I work to make data in the St. Louis area both more accessible and more usable. Uh, probably the best, uh, Best example so far is stlvacancy.com, where I aggregated data from about four different city departments, grouped it all together, um, and created a dashboard because the city couldn't tell me how many vacant buildings we had. Um, and now I can tell them, which is fun. So, 
Hi, I'm Daryl Dudley, and I'm a geographer with the Department of U.S. U.S. Department of Transportation. Um, my main role there is the uh, theme lead for the transportation layer of the National Spatial Data Infrastructure. Uh, does anybody know what the National Spatial Data Infrastructure is? Okay, so I'll, I won't get too far into it, but there are uh, certain layers at the national level that are considered uh, national assets. One of those layers is transportation, and I help the data set managers make sure they develop that data according to U.S. legislation, executive orders, and OMB circulars. Uh, part of that role is to be the transportation subcommittee lead, the chair of the transportation subcommittee. Uh, with that subcommittee, we try and develop standards, uh, heighten awareness among the community about what data is out there, how it works, and things like that. Um, so that's basically it. Uh, Steve Mather, I'm the GIS manager for Cleveland Metro Parks which is a metropolitan park district uh, in the Cleveland area. Uh, we've, been, uh, we've been users of OSM data since uh, about, what, uh, 20, 2013 or so, um, because it filled a gap that, that we had. Um, we were rolling out a, a mobile app for, for our end users. We wanted them to have a great mapping experience to be able to find their ways in the parks. Um, it was a niche that wasn't really filled uh, in the uh, in the private space. If you use Google Maps in a park, you may not be as happy um, as you are in all the other spaces you might use uh, uh, Google. Uh, OSM had um, nice had had a had a compatible license for what we were doing. Um, was contiguous across boundaries um, and did the things that that uh, the government in Ohio wasn't doing at the time. Um, and so we. We sort of pulled that in as our as our viewing layer, um, and uh, and have been using it since and contributing back uh, since that time. Thank you. All. Um, so I want to first thing I wanted to do really is so I was in uh, Margaret's talk earlier and she has another talk coming up tomorrow about um, coordinating. Um, building an address imports in Colorado, which is an on ongoing process. Um, but what's really interesting about it, I think, is that um, it, basic, it, it combines multiple uh, government sources and um, brings it into OSM. And I I'm really curious what then, um, kind of how that, how that process is going. I know you had your talk about that just now, but I think I also want to hear from others, like what, what, are, um, what interactions um, already exist with um, between uh, between OSM and government data, what kind of projects you already know about, uh, even have, have have done yourself? But I wanted to s uh, start with Margaret and ask, like, what um, kind of what motivated this, and uh, and what are what are some of the key kind of stakeholders in this in that process? Um, fortunately for us, we have a really great group of, uh, I'm going to use the term govy, and I use that term very endearingly. We have a great group of govies in Colorado that um, they actually reached out to us. And they, um, the Regional Council of Governments, they invest a lot of money in a uh, biannual, I'm saying that right, every two years, uh, imagery capture three inch and six inch for a nine county region. And so the gal that does this, her name's Ashley Summers, and uh, her world is brokering relationships and uh, acquiring funding to populate these layers and uh, keep that imagery being captured for our region. Um, so she actually reached out to us because she's got all of this really great high uh, accuracy data, but it has no attributes, it's all line work. And so um, all of you probably are familiar with uh, the level of effort that is required in quality attribution. So she reached out to us and she said, I'm really curious, you know, I'm trying all these different ways that I can build attributes and really improve the quality of this data that I have and make it more useful. Her primary directive is um, understanding actual available housing. So she would like us to get to a unit level with our addresses so she actually knows how many vacant properties she has. Interesting, the, that question is a common theme right now. And, um, and then beyond that, um, she's got a vision for what the other planometrics layers are high quality, high resolution ge you know, geometry for sidewalks, curb cuts, those kind of things, um, building attribution with that. And then what that means to the other regional stakeholders. And so her long play is 
what are the ways that we can garner funding and keep our quality data improving and growing? And um, you know, how do we maximize all the different networks and resources that we have in Colorado to do that? So um, you know, that's a big part of it. Uh, the relationship is um, you know having people in those govy spots that. Uh, you know, that they're being innovative about ways that they can fund these projects. Um, you know, they have, uh, they have a lot of directives and a lot of hard questions to answer and not necessarily all the funding. So, um, so that really, for them, was reaching out to us. Um, so and now we have the, the big challenge of delivering for her, but um, it's really about an integrated relationship going forward, and, and I think we're all excited about what, what that future looks like. Oh, you want, you want me to answer this question too? Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, we'll yeah. Yeah. Um, go ahead. So, uh, from my standpoint, where a lot of my work is taking government data and turning it into a point where it can be joined with OpenStreetMap data to answer questions. Um, a great example right now, we're working on an AI assessor project. So, essentially, we're training an AI to assess properties based off of everything we know about these properties, including how many vacancies are within. 300 yards, 500 yards, et cetera. Um, once we get that data cleaned up, we can start joining in open street map data and we can include stuff like, well, do schools, like proximity to schools have an effect? Proximity to churches have an effect? Um, and, and you guys have a lot more uh, of this like point of interest type data that we will probably pay, uh, play a factor um, in this type of project than uh, like the government does. Um, and so really it's the kind of the merging of the two data sets to produce and, and get answers to some like really tricky questions. So. Yeah. Me too? Go ahead. Oh, you got it. Yeah. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, so we're kind of a novice or new to OSM. Uh, we want to use it to augment uh, our transportation data layers. Uh, Typically what we do is use tiger line files and road data uh, from the states, but doesn't, that doesn't give us a complete picture. So we want to use uh, OpenStreetMap data to kind of augment that and make it better and more accurate. Uh, kind of the analogy I use at work to sell this is that you wouldn't write a re research paper using only one source. Uh, you would use multiple sources so that the research paper is more accurate and uh, reliable. Uh, so why would you do the same thing with data? So to make the data that we publish uh, more accurate, reliable, uh, and people can trust it. We want to use multiple sources, and I see OpenStreetMap being a way to do that. Can you remember the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, yeah. So, um, I guess what I'm after is is finding out kind of how um, how uh, what what role OpenStreetMap. So OpenStreetMap can play different roles, right? In this, um, it can be sort of a so. Um, but what, what Margaret is doing with OSM in Colorado is getting all this government data and bringing it, into, um, bringing it into OSM. And then OSM is sort of almost like a glue, right? Um, where, um, where, where kind of data sets that are really different um, become, become one in OSM and then everybody benefits and the world gets smarter because of it. But there's also, um, I mean, in, in, in your example, in, in your situation, you're, you're, you're your, your agency has actually contributed to OSM. Um, so that's, I'm just kind of after figuring out what the different interaction uh, kind of opportunities are between, um, and I know there's some good examples here, so that's what I was after kind of figuring out and setting the stage. Yeah, perfect. So, um, so I'll talk a little bit about, about the contribution side of things. So one of the, so when we, when we started out with uh, with the app that we, that we built, one of the one of the fundamental questions was, how are we going to interact with OSM? Um, are we going to do a model where where um, we've got two needs uh, for sort of this regional data set? One of those needs is uh, is the need for map tiles and display, and the other need is routing. Uh, and so the question for us, similar to transit questions that people have addressed in the past was do we put our data into it for those for those for that routing side of things um, do we become a larger player in that space or not and at the time it wasn't clear whether that was something that we should be doing and I think if we were to do it now we would absolutely be basically building our 
our network uh, in OSM. Uh, what we did instead is we took an, uh, an existing public data set and we augmented it with our own. And the special problem that we have as a park is we want to route on things that, that most data sets don't have. So if I want to understand how I'm going to bicycle around the city, I'm going to include all the bicycle trails. If I want to understand how I'm going to walk across the city, I'm going to include all the walking trails and all the walking opportunities. Uh, and so, um, so that network ended up being something that we sort of build and maintain and, and keep in a, in a database that uh, that is really uh, not more broadly shared. Um, it's available, but um, it, it hasn't gone into the larger world. Um, so it's kind of interesting thinking thinking about the future, like what what does that look like in the next stage of this? And and the reality is that, um, we've since gone through and contributed uh, back much of that trial network uh, where it hasn't already existed in OSM. Um, but again, we're still somewhat sensitive to like, I'm not going to take someone else's trace in, in, uh, of trails and remove that. They lovingly put that in, even though we did it with, you know, a, a better GPS unit. So, um, so we're still sensitive to those things, sort of things. And one of the, it's one of the sort of larger questions that I'd like to sort of think about either in this space or at the conference in general is how do you, how do you, um, walk through, how do you go through that space and how do you, as an agency, not, um, you know, if you're an agency and you're and you're um, using data, uh, ignoring uh, ignoring potential license issues, that might be a relatively uh, straightforward thing. Um, but then, uh, on the other hand, as an agency participating in the creation of data, how do you make sure that you're doing that in a responsible and ethical way? Well, so, so looking at that, looking at that future, right? So. Um, how do you get? How do you get? So, getting data into um, getting you, getting data into OSM is not always straightforward, and, and but, but OSM offers opportunities to get um, to 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 get signals of more of of improved accuracy or of improved um, networks um, that can be useful. So. Um, I know you're looking, Daryl. You're looking to benefit from those from those signals somehow. Um, what 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 do you see? What paths do you see forward? What what uh, what kind of co what what would that collaboration look like in your in your view? Um, so talking about the exchange of data and how we yeah. facilitate that, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so we're we have a couple of. of initiatives going on. One of them right now, I'll talk about it tomorrow, is a work zone data exchange initiative, which is uh, emulating the general transit feed specification where uh, authoritative sources are publishing their data, which can be consumed by mapping companies or agencies. Um, so that's kind of, I think, the route that we're looking to go is uh, establishing spatial data exchanges where updates are published by the authoritative sources on a constant basis, and we're just reading that and checking for changes. Um, so imagine a state DOT, they have a database of all the road networks and links and they publish it and we just consume it on a daily basis and check it for changes. Uh, if every, if all the states did that, then we could all consume that data in the same way and the, the, changes, the changes would be recognizable nearly instantly. Um, so kind of the, the, the whole authoritative sources are publishing it uh, whoever wants to consume it and check for changes that way. Mm -hmm. so. Do you see that going two ways? Absolutely. Um, it, it's kind of a circle or, 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 you know, it's an exchange, right? So they publish, uh, they change, we, we recognize it. Maybe we'll catch a change and they could consume our data if they wanted to or check it that way. But it's definitely a conversation between uh, the, the source and the consumer and then back to the source again from the consumer. So. I mean that also brings up the question of um, kind of authoritativeness, I guess. Um, that's a it seems to be a little bit of a shifting notion, um, but maybe that's just my imagination. Um, so I think is there I guess one one way to put it is is there an appetite to kind of keep kind of reconsider that notion of of, um, of authoritativeness, um, and and um, and how do you how do you how do you see that how do you see that kind of be um, be um, be redefined maybe in the future as a result of kind of um, OSM being being uh, being part of that equation. Um, but John, maybe you have an idea. Yeah. Um, speaking from like a St. Louis perspective, um, 
due to a variety of social, economic, and historical reasons, there's kind of a strong distrust of our local government to begin with. Um, and so trusting St. Louis as the authority, to, like the, the local government, we're already in kind of a good spot where people are looking for an authority figure that isn't that. <laughs> um, so it's a little easier for us to say, to set, for someone to become the authority, you know, I've more or less become the authority on vacancy because I tackled it really hard. And um, yeah, um, and people were, are already of the mindset that, well, our local government doesn't know what's going on or, you know, and that's unfortunate because in a lot of ways they do. Um, but a lot of it's about usability, right? Um, you can, we actually have a very fleshed out open data portal, um, with a lot of great stuff in it. But if you open the CSVs, it's, you know, you have co fields that are named column A, column B, column C, you have codes without lookup tables, like, and it, that does not reek of like authoritative, right? Even if you're doing a good job of making data available, if you're not making it usable, you're not really being a good authority on on kind of uh, the topic. So, um, so we've been working uh, a lot on that. I'm a big big believer in like the usability of things. So, yeah. um, I think an interesting concept when talking about authoritative data is the concept of primary and secondary use. These are like you know old school data terms, and the primary reason that data is collected at the government, it falls in a statutory requirement. Um, the business licenses have to be registered and maintained, and the, you know, the secretary is responsible for making sure that they're legit businesses, and they regulate business activity. And then the competitors or the users uh, on the other side say, you know what would be really cool is if you guys collected the industry type and the actual point of sale location for all these businesses, then this data would be really useful. And the government says, well, sure, but you know that's not what the statute says that I'm supposed to do. And that sounds really expensive and cumbersome to the businesses that are doing it. And you know, maybe, but not right now, you know, there's a lot that goes into that. And so um, I'm really inspired by your use case of the, um, you know, hey, we have this specific question that we're asking. And so you thus become sort of the authoritative user uh, uh, owner of a secondary use data set, right? So the primary data still exists. And I think um, certainly from a statutory perspective, the government folks that I interact with, um, you know, I don't think there will ever be a case that they don't have their own copy in-house that's their data set. But what's interesting is the, the interaction between the public users. And if there's a scenario where the public users actually begin to create that secondary use data set that answers their question, and it becomes this offshoot authoritative data set, which I'm like really in an esoteric space right now, but uh, <laughs> that is actually, I think, really well represents what the future is because it is that interchange, right? It's the back and forth, that, that loop where the government gets the benefit of users being like, hey, you, you know, maybe something simple is like this column's bar char, but it should be a number. Like, and the government's like, oh, okay, that's a doable thing. And then, you know, other situations where it's like, we really want to know the industry and the location. And they're like, cool, well, why don't you combine our data with OpenStreetMap with, um, you know, other thing, I don't know what else is out there that the license would let them. So those two things. And, <laughs> and then, you know, start working towards um, alternate spaces of authoritative data. Um, I think that's really interesting. So uh, perhaps going further on the esoteric side of things, but um, there's, there's an interesting phenomenon. And so you know, if you take a very cynical view of government um, uh, and, and the origin of governance, uh, uh, you, you could... Um, you could see it as sort of a protectionist scheme, but there's a, there's another sort of aspect to governance, which is which is the community aspect of it, and I think with the advent of of uh, projects like OpenStreetMap uh, and the larger sort of um, connected web of of uh, free and open source software projects and uh, and communities that both both local and stretching across the world that create commons 
that you have a sibling to governance uh, in those data commons. And so the question of, you know, is this a secondary authority? Is it primary authority? Is it, you know, is this, you know, um, those are those are interesting questions that sort of start to start to sort of dance around the question of what is this common thing or what are these common things that we're creating and how can we learn about you know how to how to chart futures for those um, with with some understanding of of what we've done in the past with governance and of course vice versa. Uh, so my two thoughts on authoritative data is uh, one it's changed. Uh, 25 years ago when I started my geography career, authoritative sources were the government because they were they could ensure the spatial accuracy of the data. Now that everybody has a cell phone in their pocket, I mean, you are essentially a, an authoritative source when you click your phone and say, here's, here's a latitude and longitude. You're typically within about 10 meters of being accurate. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, so that's, it's been a shift from nobody, only these few entities are authoritative sources of geospatial data. Now everybody is. Um, and also, I think it depends on the use case. Uh, for most cases, uh, having a cell phone in your pocket and being within 10 meters is OK. With the advent of automated vehicles, you're talking about 10 centimeter accuracy for that to really work. So the authoritative source for that use case is going to be super accurate. And you know the authoritative source for finding the bar down the street is in your pocket. So. Definitely, kind of a changing atmosphere. Yeah, that's, so that's an interest. Those different use cases are interesting to me too. So it, it goes to kind of what the responsibility is, also of like what what level of responsibility does uh, the federal government have, or US DOT have for uh, for catering to self driving vehicles, right? Is this um, is this is this still, is this still part of the mandate, or is the mandate like also shifting? Um, if you, I mean, you're kind of at the, at the at the top of the data food chain, so to say, as as the as the as the, at the federal level, um, is the, um, you, the the data you create has probably by far the most stakeholders of any um, of any of us. But then OSM has even more stakeholders. So how do you, um, yeah, uh, I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, so um, yes. so do you look? <laughs> let me try and make come up with a thought. So the um, do you do you see the do you see that that mandate like uh, cha changing? Like you 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 brought up the self driving vehicles already, but like how uh, is there uh, is that going to be? Um, where is that where is that mandate going to be? Like five or ten years from now, maybe. The mandate for 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 the federal highway network data, database, for example. I'm not sure of your question. Uh, no, so we'll as far as authoritative, authoritative sources for the highly accurate automated vehicles? Yeah, so are you, do you, are you going to be responsible for it? Uh, I think the so department, and I have to make sure I get this right, uh, <laughs> I'm speaking on behalf of the Department of Transportation, is going to, they try and create a framework so that industry can lead the way. Uh, we don't want to inhibit um, industry or how uh, companies will make that money, but we want to make it, we want to ensure that it's safe. Uh, and it's, it's a, the big thing about the Department of Transportation is, uh, number one is improving safety. And with automated vehicles, I think we can really improve uh, safety as far as vehicular deaths and injury. Uh, just so I think that's the, really the, the important uh, driving or you know the, the motivation there. Uh, so, how do we ensure that the data is authoritative? Uh, probably, if you're offering data to an automated vehicle and someone gets hurt, you're probably going to be liable for it. So that's a really high motivation to make sure that data is accurate and reliable. So, okay. I apologize for oh. making that very, <laughs> make, making that very, very much more unclear than it needed to be. <laughs> Did you want to respond? Yeah. Yeah. Um, a really interesting thing that was uh, presented to me uh, maybe about a year ago is the the rate at which technology is changing, right? The Moore's Law thing and all that, compared to the rate at which the legislator folk understand what the heck is going on in this other space is a totally different trajectory and speed. And so um, if we... Uh, 
If we have an expectation that the authoritative data serves our needs as users, I think we, ha we owe it to ourselves as a society and community to be vocal about that with our legislative folks to let them know that we do value open data and we do see that our taxpayer dollars paying for this and we want that data back and we want it back in an accessible, usable, clean way. And um, really, I think there's just a growing disconnect between them even understanding what exactly it is that we need and why. And so, um, you know, the autonomous vehicle question and the collection of that data is something that the legislative folk are probably like, that's probably going to be a big issue soon. But we, you know, if it's even on their radar, they're not really equipped with the ability to understand the technical details of it. And obviously with Facebook and the congressional questioning, like that was super clear that they didn't even really understand the tech of what was going on behind the uh, privacy breaches and stuff. So, um, so there's this big component about, um, you know, the tech is just moving so fast and then the rest of the world is sort of still just the rest of the world and um, knowing what's going on in the tech industry and regulating it and then ultimately having it like provide the services back to us that we need is a really, really compelling piece of all this. That just the rate of change is not something that, um, you know, this legislative body can keep up with. So, yeah, I, I don't know the answer. I, just, yeah. I, I would actually throw on, in addition to that, so outside of the legislative bodies, you've got this whole operational side of the government that people tend to not think about as much. Um, but the people that are actually doing the work, that are actually generating this data, a lot of them don't have training in this at all. Um, an example from, like, my data set, we use force-free data pretty heavily because the forestry department is who ends up mowing the lawns of buildings that aren't being maintained and we can use that as an indicator that a property might be vacant. To the best of my knowledge, nobody in that entire department has any formal training in computers at all, right? Um, you know, and they work really hard, they're smart people, but like this is so far out of their wheelhouse. You know, almost everybody that works in your local government has a background in urban planning, public policy, conservation, like a myriad of specialty fields that don't involve a class in databases. Um, so when you work with them, it's kind of our responsibility, at least in my eyes, it's our responsibility not only like kind of hold them accountable, but also to help them, right? Um, it's, it's really important that we as citizens kind of step up to that and be like, we recognize that like, I want this data out of the forestry department. I recognize that you don't know, you don't necessarily know what I'm asking for, and that this machine in your basement that runs MS-DOS has worked for you for the last 30 years. <laughs> um, and I'm, what I'm asking for you to do is to make a pretty significant change and learn a lot of new skills. Um, but, you know, in exchange for that, let me build you some tools that are going to make your job easier day to day. Let me provide, help you like, like, you know, let me train you on how to use some of this stuff. Let me help advocate to the politicians and things that you need the budget to make these changes because all of that, it's, you know, all of this has to fall into place in order for the data to be good. So that, that actually, unless someone else wants to respond to that. So that actually um, brings up a question of, like we've been talking about awesome data, but um, if, you, if you think about people who are perhaps not, um, don't have the right tooling or um, to, to create what is needed, um, is there a place for kind of OSM tooling? Like OSM has spent, it has invested a lot in creating uh, very kind of beginner friendly um, tooling. Um, is there, do you see any opportunity for um, things like the ID editor, things like, um, like I'm, I'm gonna say Meprolet, <laughs> um, um, to be adopted, maybe not to contribute to OSM, but just to, just to kind of help maintain help maintain your own data. I'm, I'm, I'm going a little bit on a tangent here perhaps, but is that is that something that's completely unrealistic? Um, anyone who's? Um, we try and take the, the view that whatever gets the job done best. So we're trying not to be an Esri shop or a Mapbox shop or whatever, but whatever tool fits uh, and makes that job the easiest and most efficient to do it. So I, I wouldn't, we don't have any OSM tools that we use, but there's certainly, I think the right uh, environment for that. If we found one that worked for us and, and could make the job, get the job done, certainly. Um, so in addition to sort of parks in Northeast Ohio, 
Um, we have a um, we have within our within our metro park system we have a, a a zoo and a zoological society which do international projects and amongst them um, work with uh, work with gorilla conservation in Rwanda. Um, so a project a couple of years ago we actually uh, had the opportunity to um, to help with looking at the changes in um, in what's happening outside Volcanoes National Park um, that has an impact on uh, mountain gorillas um, and mapping that out. And we actually used JOSM because uh, it allowed us to square buildings. <laughs> I mean, it was as simple as that, right? <laughs> I mean, I think it's really butts and seats, right? And who's running the shop and so, depending on the, the innovative nature and also the um, how, how folks realize that their data can be improved by different things really goes back to who that person is and who's working in that shop. Um, uh, certainly a lot of organizations are just, you know, like, tell me what you can do. Like, we're amenable to it and we're open. So I don't think there's any, like, real restrictions or barriers other than just the learning curve of even being aware of these things being out there. Um, so not much to add, but just a little. Um, I come from, like, a, a slightly different area. Like, you guys all have dedicated teams. I mostly work with volunteers. So a big part of my tool selection process is how long does it take me to teach a volunteer to use this tool? Um, you know, there, there's a lot of work that's being done on my projects that, you know, it realistically should be done in Python, but we're doing it in, in with an ETL tool because it's faster for me to teach them how to use a drag and drop interface than it is for me to teach them Python. Um, put, uh, kind of a corollary to that, and this comes from, you know, I've been doing software development since like for 10 years. Oh my God, I'm old. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if you're, if you're developing one of these tools, um, you know, I, I've, I've long been of the mindset that like, if your tool requires education, then you haven't made it easy enough to use yet. Um, you know, Jossum's great, Jossum's super powerful. I cannot stick it in front of it, just like a college student and be like, use this. Like they have to look stuff up, they, need, they have to ask questions. Um, and that's, you know, that's the curse of like, all open source efforts, essentially, <laughs> um, because it's a lot harder to get somebody. People don't get as fired up about making tutorials and uh, like user interface stuff as they do about making like functions. You know, oh, I made it do this thing it did before, as opposed to, oh, well, well, you know, I made it so it's slightly easier to do this this thing. But it, it's a really important part of making um, like community involvement happen is is ease of use. So. I, w I want to give you all an um, opportunity to um, ask questions also, but there is one um, I did I did I do want to mention sort of the elephant in the room, which is the, you know, the OSM license. I was I'm really I'm really <laughs> I'm sorry I have to do it. Um, well, it's, it's been great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Come back here. <laughs> I'll buy you a drink later. Um, so I'm just really curious how that's being looked at. Like I'm, I'm come from a private sector background where people kind of have a tendency to um, f figure things out or, or kind of um, ignore such pesky problems. Um, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't really say that. Um, no, yeah, it is actually. So, um, so what? I'm, I'm just really curious how that, how that's being looked at on the, in the, on the government side of things. When you look at using OSM data or using, using OSM um, um, in whatever way, or giving data back is, I think, the, the simpler part of the problem. But using OSM data is, the, is the trickier part, perhaps. Um, anyone want to, anyone want to start? I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> I figure that's my that's my job now. Um, yeah, I guess I guess that that was part of the question when we, when we were thinking about like should we do our routing in OSM? Um, and I don't know if I have a good answer. I mean, one of the we, we have similar questions with uh, with software development. Um, like how you know if we develop something as an agency um, and uh, either directly or fund it. So we started the project Open Drone Map. It's GPLv3. Um, uh, the reality is that the license of any of the work that we contribute to that is probably not GPLv3. 
but relicensed through GPL v3, right? Um, now, it gets tangled because you can't really use much of that code without, um, without the rest of the project. Um, and I don't think that's, that's not really, a, that, that doesn't seem to cause us any headaches. Um, but I think it's similar to the question of, of the, the data question and, and, uh, and the OSM <laughs> license uh, and was part of the hesitation in, in building our network in OSM. Um, I don't think we'd have a problem with it now because we sort of navigated that with, with uh, copyleft licenses. Um, but it's certainly interesting at the federal level. Nice segue. <laughs> uh, so at the federal government, we create data and it should be available to the taxpayers because they've already paid for it. Uh, we want to make it accessible. Uh, we want to make sure that it helps people make decisions, uh, informed decisions. Uh, and we have recently in the past couple of years uh, started collecting transit data and inner city bus data. Uh, the transit data is licensed to us under the Creative Commons license attribution. So for uh, every transit stop or bus stop or schedule we get through GTFS from a transit authority, uh, that data is tagged as open uh, Creative Commons attribution. So if somebody else uses it, they have to attribute where they got the data. So we want to give uh, we want to give credit where it's due, right? These guys created the data. We want to make sure that they get credit for it. Uh, we don't want to take uh, we don't want to claim uh, that you know we don't want to take all the credit. It's for the inner city bus uh, data because they're private companies. We've done a Creative Commons uh, attribution non-commercial license, meaning that uh, you can't use the data for profit if you get it from us. Um, so we want to get to the point where we can use OpenStreetMap, and I think we can. Um, I think there's a short, there's a minor gap that we have to close, and uh, I think we're, I'm enthusiastic that we can do it. Um, but uh, the, the general counsel at the department wants to keep it simple for our customers, so we want to keep the Creative Commons license um, for all the data that we serve or publish. Um, the open database license is very similar to the Creative Commons attribution license. Um, so finding some way to, to kind of close that gap between the open database license and the Creative Commons license I think is where we're headed. Uh, I would like to see that happen. Uh, uh, this community is, is amazing, does amazing work. And if we could publish that data, having them get access to it better, I think it benefits not only us but also OSM. Um, how would we do that? So, say we're doing we're consuming roads from OSM, we would attribute uh, a source at the feature level. So, for each road segment, you would know whether whether it came from Tiger or from a state or from OSM or something like that. And then, maybe at the feature level too, as far as uh, probably the licensing associated with that feature. So, you could pull out all the data that were uh, didn't have a an open data license, you could pull it out and separate it and then publish the rest of it or something like that. But I think it's a very, very doable. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can talk to this all day a little bit. Um, so I, I very aggressively pawn any sort of legal talk off of to my supervisor. So Paul Sorensen, if you're watching this, thank you very much. Um, but I do know that like the open source uh, issue, like technically speaking, my, like my paychecks are signed for it by University of Missouri St. Louis. So anything I do ends up going through like the university legal system and all of this stuff scares the bejesus out of them um, because, you know, we're the show me state and we don't like change. Um, <laughs> and all of it, like I, just every other day, I'm like, here's this crazy new thing I'm going to do that's never been done before. Like, ah, have fun. <laughs> Um, but it's also allowing like a lot of really interesting uh, opportunities. Um, we're kicking off a pilot program in a couple of weeks where consulting firms in the area, so like Slalom, Doherty, CSG Solutions, Amatech, um, can donate their benched consultants to us. So I'm getting like a team of like six professional, like high grip performing software developers for free. <laughs> um, and the only way it's able to work is because we were able to tell them like everything that they produce while they're for us, it's going into the, like into 
like the public domain. Like it's all open source. So like we're not going to retain any rights. We're not going to make any money off of what you're. This is a donation that you are making to the community, and that that has enabled like so much. Like just those those words of like it's for the community, opens up doors. Like it it makes so many things possible. So yeah. I'm just gonna say plus one to attribution and metadata. <laughs> so, um, do we have a question back there? I, I did actually have a question. Is it okay to follow up on that? Of course. Um, do you want to get the mic for a moment? Oh. I think it's. I'm not loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just a. No, I know. I know. For the AV. It's for his boss who's listening. Um, two questions. Um, the first is for you from the government. I can't remember your name. I'm sorry. Uh, why is it important for the government to put a non-commercial use on a license on data that they provide? Uh, because the bus data is like a private company. Oh, so you can't re-release. You can't redistribute their. Right. Because it's private. Okay. Gotcha. So that's like you just. So you can re redistribute it for open use? Yes. Okay. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Uh, the other is just in general. By attribution, or the, the attribution portion of licenses, which people have spoken in favor of, often can actually be a barrier for use uh, by other agencies. Um, and partially the question is, does it become unwieldy because of that requirement? Or have you got any feedback, anybody, that that makes it un too unwieldy because you have to either put it on your little credits page or you put it on a web page? Have you ever gotten any weird requests about attribution that block the use of that data. Um, that's for everyone. For us, no. Uh, we're mandated by law to create metadata for our information. Um, so along with that metadata is uh, kind of a lineage of how the data is created. Um, so uh, we're very adamant that data, metadata gets created. Uh, we believe that it uh, lends credibility to the data, people believe in it more. Uh, also, you know where it came from and how it was created and what's in it. Uh, makes it discoverable. Uh, so that's one way we do it. Uh, as far as the feature level attribution, as we aggregate data sets, as we start to aggregate data sets, I think it's important where p that people understand where that data came from. So to us, it's, it's not an impediment at all. I think it, it enhances people's confidence in the data. May as well keep the theme going with talking about the feds here. Um, so has the Geospatial Data Act of 2018 had any impact yet for the DOT, or have you seen where that's going to go? Uh, we've been, the Geospatial Data Act uh, enacted in, in October of 2018 gave us a year to prepare. So the Federal Geographic Data Committee has created uh, working groups to study the act and see how it affects uh, OMB A16 and Executive Order 12906, which both deal with the defining how the federal government manages its geospatial data assets. Um, so the, dead, the year's almost up. Uh, after that year is up, we have five years to create data standards for every geospatial data asset that we manage. Uh, after that five years, if we don't comply with the standard that we created, uh, then they can start taking funding away. So we're very interested and very motivated to <laughs> get this done. Uh, I would like to have a job in five or six years from now. Uh, so highly motivated. Um, that being said, having lessons learned, I've created a couple of data standards in the past and nobody uses them uh, because they're, they were unwieldy, uh, tried to do everything. Uh, now looking at the market with DTFS, um, and how that's been a huge, huge success, uh, trying to be very flexible as far as creating uh, data standards, making like the, just the minimum content 
the rules we use now are everybody's got to use it. They've got to use it in the same way. So uh, the road data set we have now, I think, for a road segment has uh, five attributes, and they all deal with uh, identity, location, um, and metadata. So did I answer your question? <laughs> so. All right. This has been great. Thanks. Um, I'm going to kind of turn it around to all of us. Like, if you had an ask for the OpenStreetMap community, what would that be? Can I use your data? <laughs> <laughs> Please. Uh, what are we going to ask of you guys? What, what do we need from the OSM community? Um, I want to say help, but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I think for me probably the biggest ask is your voice and your gratitude. If uh, I'm going to totally be stealing this from an open data panel that was in uh, the Boulder 2017, and uh, my colleague said, you know, if you're using public data for any reason at all, uh, please reach out to those providers and say thank you and that you appreciate it. And best case scenario, let them know what cool thing you're doing with it so that they can then turn around and let their folks know that, hey, all the stuff that we're doing is not going unnoticed by the community at large. And, and people are doing cool stuff with it. And we should keep you know, providing the service to them because that's what we're here for and they really appreciate it. So, um, so say thank you and then, um, you know, integrate public data and OpenStreetMap and do cool stuff with it. Like, show us what you got. Um, I'm going to break the rules. I have two. <laughs> um, first is that usability aspect. Um, like I said, I've, I've, I've got a fairly like I'm pretty well into my career as like a technical specialist and GIS stuff just scares the bejesus out of me. Um, there's so much jargon. I don't know what any of it means. None of it has like no tool I use has info, like those handy little info buttons that explains like what this setting does, like just make it easy. <laughs> um, the other one is um, everybody in this room is, is fairly technical, right? Um, to some degree, right? Um, I think as like those technology people, we have kind of a responsibility to use those skills. And I, like, I'm kind of preaching to the choir because you're, you're here because you're using your using those skills to help your communities. But I'm a big proponent of technical philanthropy, right? I've worked at too many companies where they're like, we're doing a community service day and we're doing Habitat for Humanity. Be like, you pay those people $150,000 a year to build ba databases and you're making them swing a hammer? Um, like, no, that's not what they should be doing for the community. Like, you know, um, if you want to volunteer, volunteer in a way that utilizes your skills and maximizes your impact. You know, I can, I can, yeah, I'm really big and I can carry a lot of two by fours, but you know, there are more impactful things I can do. Steve, do you have anything to add? I'd say plus one to what Margaret said, because, uh, you know, there are, I think of, um, I won't, I won't, let's see, can I, can I, can I tell this with enough detail without getting anyone in trouble? Uh, no, but there are, there are definitely cases, <laughs> there are definitely cases where, where uh, government agencies will provide data and, uh, and there are users of that data that are great consumers of it without without the contribution back, and that's not the nature of, of anyone I've interacted with in the in the uh, OSM community. Um, and I I, I kind of felt like like that question. I mean, to the extent that that I felt like, well, what do you mean? I'm not on the other side of this. I'm part I'm part of that community. Like you know, so so it was like, oh, okay. What 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 does it look like to be outside that? Um, so that's that's a really great aspect, but the, there is an extent to which, um, when you work as a public servant, um, you're providing that for a greater good that is abstract. And one really valuable thing, much like for everyone within the OSM community, um, is for that abstract thing to not always be abstract, for there to be very specific things like, hey, it was really helpful for sharing those uh, those depth maps of, of lakes because we're going to use it for X, Y, and Z. Um, those those are really really valuable things. So, 
Uh, so no big ask yet, but I would like to get to the point where we can make the ask of the OSM community to map certain features for us. Um, one, one, I was talking to Martin Jean, Martin Jean? Martin. Martin, sorry, uh, um, about uh, helicopter pads and that the FAA uh, needs help locating them accurately. Uh, so that might be something that we could do. You know, it's like, hey, we need to locate these helipads. Can the OSM community help us with that? Uh, bridges are, most of the bridges are well located, some of them are not, uh, things like that. So identifying where we have failures are, uh, are not doing the best at something and then ha asking the community to help us correct that just to make the data, the data better and more reliable. Uh, hi, I'm Kathleen. I'm actually going to be talking tomorrow about ODBL uh, inbound license compatibility. So I'm sure that'll be very exciting for all of you. Um, <laughs> uh, I can also buy you a beer if yeah, our. Uh... I can bring a flask. If you... <laughs> um, so the question I had for you, this might be really technical, is um, in your respective offices, who is it that is setting the license? for your data, for, for the data that you're, you're putting out? Like, who picks the license? Um, so for us, the selection for the Colorado Information Marketplace specifically comes in way early in the process about determining which layers or data sets go out to the public. So, uh, so everyone makes it really simple by, of course, obviously not releasing PII, just duh. But so everything that fits in the realm of could go out to the public, it's that's that first layer of vetting, um, you know, are we comfortable and making sure that the providers feel, com feel comfortable with it going out to the public. So everything that goes out is uh, public domain. Um, so for the state of Colorado and the processes that are set up there, it's really about way early in the process determining the maturity of each data set and, and where it's at in terms of its release date, and then setting up a, a calendar and schedule for that, and obviously saving the really hard ones for last <laughs> and hoping that other really smart folks other than us figure it out beforehand so that we can adapt as it comes along. Um, so the Office of General Counsel is basically where the directives come from, but it's really a conversation between us and the data authorities uh, in the instance of transit uh, organizations. Uh, they have, we have to sign an agreement with each individual authority, transit authority. Uh, the same thing with the buses. So each, we can't do all the buses. We have to, we can only collect the data from the bus companies that agree to the licensing that we propose. Uh, so that's where it comes from. All other federal government data is open. So the only reason we're attaching licenses to data like that is because they're from a third party. So. Uh, Ohio's had a pretty strong open data policy for a long time. So the question is more, is it data or not? <laughs> sure, sure, uh, a tangible example. Um, we, you know, we, not, not surprisingly, we collect drone imagery for, for, for data. And so, you know, very early in the process, I had the conversation with, with, our, with our chief legal and ethics uh, chief, well, anyway, our chief of legal affairs um, about whether the data we were, whether the images we were collecting would be considered data or whether those are things over which we can hold copyright. Um, and we came down on a decision that b because of the purpose of it, because of the ways in which we're using that particular data that is in fact data and therefore subject to Ohio Revised Code as data. And then the Ohio Revised Code takes care of the rest. Hey, I got a question. Um, I support a program that brings OSM, government program, bring OSM and get it out to a lot of people. And the question I get all the time from all my people who've been in government for a long, long time, they're like, ooh, open source, I don't trust it, right? Like, ooh, I don't know if I could do this. So I know I have, I have my answer, what I say, and like, no, it's getting validated, like, I trust Esri. I'm like, well, it's, it's open treatment in Esri, it's right there, right? And Microsoft and all these, all these groups do it. So 
What do you say when you get to those questions? How do you answer that question when you try to get people on the government side to trust the open source or open street map? Uh, as far as the data is concerned, okay, that's, um, I think you have to assess each data set according to how it's collected and again, you get into the, the fact of what's an authoritative source. Um, so I guess you would get to the point or as far as if we, if I, at the point where I can start combining road networks from uh, census, state governments, USGS, OSM, uh, doing some kind of assessment about which feature is actually the most accurate would be a way to do that. As far as open source code and stuff like that, the federal government, because yeah, we're not gonna risk the, the infrastructure on somebody else's code that we don't know. <laughs> okay, that is a, yes, that's a good, <laughs> I am wrong and that's a good, that's a great counter example. <laughs> There are some open sources that we would use, but you know, uh, that's a pretty strong organization that writes R. We're not going to use Joe Schmo's open source code code to to run programs. So. I think I think I believe Department of the Interior actually uses Open Drone Map. So okay. uh. <laughs> <laughs> that's data, right? And that was originally no, 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 no. no that's 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 the software. Software. Yep, yep. Uh, I don't know if I can speak to the to the to the data question. I don't think we've really uh, thought much about that. But from the software perspective, it's it's something that comes up periodically, and definitely something that well, can you can you can you really trust you know yeah. open source? Uh, I liked. It, to the question of data, I liked what you said early, earlier about the, the the question of you wouldn't you wouldn't write a paper with only one source. Um, so you know, I think I think that's something that that I'm going to steal, um, borrow, uh, and attribute. <laughs> uh, and then with open source, I think for us, the the original sort of discussion, frankly, it came down to cost. I said, well, we can go this route, or we can go this route, and uh, and my my director said, what's, well, what, what's, what's this route? Well, um, I'm getting a quote of about $50,000 a year. Okay, well, I guess you're building it, Steve. Uh, so, so since then, we haven't had the conversation. Last. Um, yeah, so I haven't, uh, I haven't dealt with this getting data in, but I ran into a similar problem like when we first built our vacancy portal, like why would they listen to me? I was just some guy that showed up at the town hall one day and was like, hey, I built a thing. Um, but the trick was we built a thing that we knew that they really needed and they needed, they didn't even know we were doing it until it was done, <laughs> right? Um, and so we were able to get our foot in the door because we delivered it an immense amount of value for almost no input. And then once you have that, it's then you can start asking for that input. Be like, well, you know, I was able to do all of this without any help from you. Imagine what I can do if you like answer my emails, <laughs> right? Um, um, and that that's just that's worked really well as a strategy for um, getting any sort of compliance out of anybody. Basically, it's like show them that it is more valuable to them to work with you than it is to fight you on whatever it is. So. So, so I'm curious, you know, you said earlier about sort of augmenting capacity and of, of, of government. And this is something that I think about a lot. We've built a highly technical, highly competent shop. Um, we've also, you know, we've had turnover of highly technical people who we, you know, and really great people. I love them and I'm glad that they're, they're off in the world doing other great things. Um, but I guess, I guess there's a question. I, uh, should I have to tie this back to OSM somehow? Uh, and maybe this is a question over beer. But I guess the question is how do how do you, where do, where does capacity reside? You know, and maybe the, maybe this maybe this or where should capacity reside as far as in government in OS in the OSM community in a private corporation that's you know interacting with each? Um, and do you have any thoughts on on how that works? Um, so I found most of my capacity in private sector. Um, actually, I'm going to point at Michael here as like one of my key volunteers. Um, Michael's a freelance entrepreneur. He does a lot of like consulting freelancing. Um, and in order to get like good contracts, he needs to be able to demonstrate that he knows what the hell he's doing. 
and he needs to be able to work with technologies that maybe hasn't worked before. So anytime I have work that needs to be done, I try to tailor it. If I want Michael to work on it, I try to do it with a technology that I know he's interested in learning. I try to like, it's all open source. So like I make sure like, Hey, let's do this in GitHub so you can attribute it. And then people can see that you've done this before. Um, make it valuable to them outside of like paycheck. Um, and that has worked really well for freelance consulting for like consultants, especially that work for like really big firms, like these like slalom type consultants, they're, they're super smart, but everything they do is locked behind an NDA. Right. Um, and if you're like, Hey, if you give me like, you know, one Saturday a month, like, you know, I'll order pizza, like just come to my office for eight hours. We're just going to work on this thing. Um, and you can put your name on it. It gets you, you, you know, exposure to this technology. You're not allowed to use at work because it's weird and like open source and like, you know, Monsanto doesn't want to touch it, but like, whatever you want to learn Docker, like I'll use Docker, like <laughs> whatever you want, man. <laughs> um, and that, that works really well and putting them in a room with like-minded folks where they can learn from each other. Um, one of the, the caveats to this, and this is probably where people like me a little less is you have to be really selective with that volunteer base. I've had very bad luck with like meetup.com, right? Because I, I get what, I refer to it as like Parks and Rec syndrome. You get like a, you know, as soon as it's like something like this, you get a lot of like really well-meaning, strongly opinionated people that don't really know what they're talking about and don't like they just gum up the works, right? Um, we've had a surprising number of people that come to like open data meetups, don't know SQL at all, like don't know how to use their computer, don't show up without a computer, right? Um, and they're there because they care about their community. So like I don't want to like you know, um, I'm not disparaging them. I'm not saying they're bad people, but for technical projects, you need technical people. And the more non-technical people you have there, the less work that is ultimately going to get done. Cause you're going to spend your time explaining stuff to these people. You're going to, they're going to want to talk about things rather than work on things. And it just, it, it comes up the works. So, um, there is work you can find for those, those types of folks. We have separate events for those types of folks. Um, a great one is like if just bulk SQL writing, because you can teach someone how to write like a basic SQL statement to like insert data into this other database, right? That is a like one hour tutorial. And if you have like, you know, 60 tables that need to get created, that's great work for that type of group of people. They'll come, they'll help, they'll learn about the data, they'll, they'll contribute. Um, and they'll save me a ton of time of just doing, you know, what is a fairly tedious task for me. But to them, it's not because it's a new thing for them, so. I think I think we'll have to uh, leave it at that. This was this was um, this was really interesting to me. I hope to you as well. Um, these all these folks are going to be around for the rest of the weekend, as far as I know. If, I, if we haven't scared them away, um, so so please 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 ask them more questions, share your ideas, and um, and uh, help move this move this discussion forward. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Thank you.